Okay, we're ready. All right, today's our last lecture. And I'm going to finish up on rheometry, and then I want to talk about the homework, um, which is due today, but uh, I said I would accept it a little later if people needed it. I'm particularly concerned about the one problem, problem three, uh, to make sure that you have enough information to solve that problem. So I'll talk about that when I finish. Also, today I added a bunch of new lecture slides to lecture 41, and so I've given you a copy of the entire lecture 41. And uh, I hope this will fill out our elongational discussion today a little bit. So we've been talking about chapter 10, which is rheometry, and that's the measurement of flow properties. And what we've seen so far is that it's it's not always that straightforward to measure flow properties because although we started with a very simple logic, let's pick a very simple flow and we'll impose that flow on the material and then when we measure some very specific stresses that we've gone to some effort to make them simple and easy to understand, then we'll get material functions. And then we saw lots of measurements of them so it must be possible to do it, but we hid the fact from you all this time that, in fact, it's a little bit difficult to, to make those measurements because that idea of I'm going to impose this flow, it's not as easily done as it sounds. And it's, it's a very idealized flow, and we can't really make those idealized flows. So all we can do is something real, and doing something real means we have to back calculate and do a few tricks to try to make things turn out um, to be the quantities we're interested in. So we talked about shear and today we're going to talk about elongational flows. In shear flows we looked at uh, Conan plate, parallel plate, and the cuet flow. Uh, the double cuet and the, which is this one here, and the, the true parallel plate, they have very simple um, explanations for how the geometry works and they're very similar to what we've discussed so far. The capillary flow we went into quite a bit of detail and saw that we needed corrections for the fact that we have entry and exit effects and also for any uh, lack of uh, any slip on the boundaries and also for the fact that the flow is inhomogeneous. It's got a non-parabolic velocity profile. So in the end, at the end of the day, from the capillary rheometer or from any of the other shear geometries, we can measure shear viscosity. But you know there's that other quantity, the first normal stress difference. I didn't talk about that, uh, but there's some discussion in the text. You can measure first normal stress difference and relate it to the upward thrust on the parallel plate or the upward thrust on the conan plate. It's most easily measured on the conan plate. Meaning, by easily measured, I mean it's easiest to re relate it to the material functions. And the equations are in the book. I didn't, uh, this is a new slide for this lecture. This is not on the web version. Um, the second normal stress difference is something that's uh, very difficult to measure and uh, very rare, in fact. In fact, it was only in 2003, 2004 that Jay Magda, who's a rheologist at the University of Utah and his postdoc, um, worked out this way of measuring the second normal stress difference by putting stress, normal stress sensors in a radial direction on a parallel plate. So until there was this kind of microelectronic manufacturing method of putting small uh, pressure sensors onto a plate the size of a quarter, it wasn't even possible to manufacture such a thing. So when I was in grad school, this didn't exist, and now it does. So this is an instrument that you can just put on any commercial rheometer. If you go to their website, they'll sell you it, rheosense.com. And you can use the distribution of normal stresses along this radial direction and the analysis that is given in Bird's book to deduce, if you have the first normal stress difference, you can deduce the second from measurements of this pressure distribution as a function of radial position. So you see we have to be quite clever and innovative to get these quantities. They're not, they're not so easily obtained. Here are some representative results from Beck and Magda's paper. This is second normal stress difference, first normal stress difference uh, on a certified standard and you can see that they do a very nice job of meeting the certified standard results. 
So these references are in your notes if you are in any, any way interested. I mentioned this, but I thought I would show this slide. These are actually from the book. Um, at the high shear rates, the measurement in the parallel plate and cone and plate rheometers are limited by these kind of defects that occur near the edges. So you see the edges become very rough here. Um, and in fact, it dimples in a little bit towards the edges, quite dimpled in here. And I've even seen where after shearing, you open up the instrument and there's a, a blob of polymer completely outside of the parallel plates. And you look inside and there's just a few residual pieces. And think about it, you have a very elastic material and you've kind of, it's almost like, like an eraser or something. You're, you're taking this highly elastic material and, and turning it and it just sort of rolls up and out of the gap. So this is uh, some real life pictures here of what that instability can look like and why we are limited at very high rates in those type, types of flows. We talked a little bit about Kuwait flow, not too much. Um, the equations are in the book. And now I want to move on to elongational flow. Okay, so elongational flow is the other standard flow. And I think you already know that it's more difficult to produce. And over even my career in rheology, they've been inventing and discarding elongational rheometers constantly. So I'm going to show you some of the classic methods and talk about what the, some of the pros and cons are. And I'll show you some of the newer methods. That's why I added a bunch of new slides. So here are some uh, methods that were tried in the, uh, let's say, 80s. And maybe the 80s would be the right decade, 80s and 90s. Uh, I have a picture of a device that works something like this. The idea is that you, you take a, a sample of polymer and you stretch it. So here is the classic, you know, instron tensile testing stretch. But this doesn't produce uniaxial elongational flow because of the end effects. Also, um, you need to move these platens, these grabbers, apart at an exponentially increasing rate in order to produce our flow. And look, there's just not a lot of space on an instron testing machine. So while this is very useful in mechanical engineering for, for steel and solid plastics, not so useful in for liquids. So this device uses rollers to stretch it an infinite amount. And we can use the computer controllers to get these rollers to move at whatever speed we like. Here's a very simple test where you use gravity to drive the flow. Um, you put a sample, a, a liquid sample in between and essentially drop the bottom plate and you can get it to stretch. This was a device that was commercialized by a uh, rare metrics company, which is now part of TA Instruments, where they uh, use suction to pull material in. And then in this entire device, these two nozzles appeared in a bath and you could produce elongational flow there. And then the biaxial st uh, step strain experiment, which is a it's the inverse of a stretch. It's a squish. So a sudden squish in the one direction, um, resulting in the flow outward. Now, if we do this kind of just sort of instron tensile stretching of a sample, how do we relate that to elongational properties? Well, in, in principle, it's easy. Uh, tau 1, 1 minus tau 2, 2 uh, is equal to the tensile force, so you just have a load cell there, divided by the cross-sectional area. So the tricky thing is, is that they're all changing with time. It's not like steady shear flow where you put this force on and you, it comes to a steady state. You watch the curve go up to a steady value. Instead, it's constantly changing. Uh, because the cross-sectional area is constantly changing, the force is constantly changing as well. So if you assume that there's just an affine deformation and that everything just completely shrinks, as this stretches, the cross-section shrinks according to the mass balance, you can get an instantaneous uh, calculation of the elongational viscosity. In practice, this is a nightmare. Uh, there's so many things that can and do go wrong with it. Uh, you're in, in the equations I just showed, you start with an initial sample, you get a final sample, everything is homogeneous. So in every small location, there's ex experiencing the same amount of stretch. But in real life, there's uh, bubbles and particles and end effects because you have to grab onto the ends. And as you move these things rapidly apart, you end up 
have with a very thin filament, which is then subject to, gra to gravity, to air, to you walking by, to all kinds of things. So this is a very irreproducible experiment and is not performed in practice. It's the easiest one to talk about, not performed in practice. So uh, a modern technique that's related to this uh, was developed by Tam Sridhar in Australia. And this is uh, a version of a test that uh, is often pantomimed by just moving your fingers apart. So there are a lot of practitioners in, in rheology that can just sort of stick their hands into something and kind of go like this and get a good sense of what the elongational properties are because they have a lot of experience. So we can kind of computerize that. Uh, by taking two plates, putting a sample in between, and pulling them apart at an exponential rate. Now, this is also not homogeneous, because all this stuff going on at the ends uh, is not correct. Um, and we also, in order to measure an elongational property, we have to monitor the, the shape of, the, of, the, of this filament here in the center. So the way this is carried out uh, by Tam Sridhar and uh, also by Gareth McKinley at MIT has this instrument, Susan Muller at Berkeley has this instrument, is to use lasers to uh, monitor the cross-sectional area so that you know the actual change in cross-sectional area with time, so you don't have to assume the mass balance, and uh, make some accommodations like our weisenberg rabinowitz correction, we have to try to make some kind of accommodation, assuming as little as possible, for what's going on at the ends. So they, they spent really a decade looking at ver a variety of things like surface tension and, uh, uh, and the various stretchings that are going on here near the surface, trying to get an algorithm together, a computer algorithm together, that would eliminate those effects as much as possible. They were only they were reasonably successful, but not, not overwhelmingly successful. This uh, filament stretching rheometer is still a research-grade uh, uh, research type instrument. It's built by individual researchers, and it's not something you can just buy. This is uh, a commercial rheometer. It's like the one I had in my schematic. It's called the Rheometrix Mechanical uh, Extensional Rheometer. And it uses these kind of rotating belts to pull a sample. It's very similar to the one where I showed the rollers pulling it. And again, you can see that we go to quite a lot of uh, difficulty, to quite an amount of trouble to eliminate all these crazy effects. So there's an air table here that's suspending the sample so that it won't sag when you, when you heat it up. Uh, you put it on these tables and there's a rotating clamp on the top and the bottom, the, t the top one is not shown. Um, and it, it grabs on using a belt and grabs onto this sample and pulls it, it's rotating around like this, and the sample comes flying through. We had this one in my laboratory in Korea. Uh, they have it at the University of Minnesota. One of the co-developers of this was Chris McCosco at the University of Minnesota. This is a paper, these sketches are from a paper where they compared the extensional viscosity of various machines and they talked about how difficult it is to make these measurements. And what they said was, you really have to pay very close attention in order to get the strain that you, that you command. The instrument itself had problems with higher shear rate um, experiments because as you can imagine it, it's really pulling quite hard on the sample and it deforms and is inhomogeneous. I know from talking to people who've done these experiments that the preparation of the initial sample is critical. If it has dirt, if it has bubbles, if it's not quite square, it throws the whole instrument off. Yes, they have a, they, they have a uh, a tension, an adjustable tension on them that's coming down and keeping that same amount of force on the sample at all times. Also, th the original in inventors of this device didn't trust the deformation to just be a standard mass balance. So they didn't say, well, if it pulls out this much, it must contract in the other direction by the mass balance. Instead, they would always, it's a very clever thing, they have this the sample, which maybe looks like, um, 
half a, it's, it's actually about a, a centimeter wide, so a centimeter in this direction and maybe eight centimeters long. So they have that sample in there, and what they would do is they, they have this little, this little uh, device that goes in there and allows you to sprinkle the surface with little beads. And then they have a camera on the top that would then film the whole deformation, and you could watch those beads and see what the deformation actually was. And it's a lot of trouble to go through and actually check that you're really getting the deformation that you think you're getting. So a lot of people who do these experiments, they just skip it, and they do the mass balance. And again, this paper points out that um, they, although it's tedious, they recommend that you do that because the strain rate is the main problem with this instrument. So we can get a flavor from this that this is not, this is not for the faint of heart. It requires a kind of a dedication to the experiment to be able to take elongational uh, measurements. Now this is a new instrument. Um, where's the date? Uh, it comes from maybe 2004, 2005. This is, uh, I was very excited to see this instrument first uh, discussed at the Society of Rheology meeting. Uh, Martin Sentmanat um, invented this at Goodyear Company, and it's a very clever device that uses rotating, two rotating drums that you put, let's say, a piece of rubber in his case because he works for Goodyear on it, and you rotate them counter rotating, and they wrap up the sample as they go. So it's possible to get an elongational deformation in the center region here. It sounds like a good idea. You have to check it, and he, he did check it. He did all kinds of uh, strain measurements to see that, in fact, in, the re in this region it was elongational flow. And he can measure the amount of effort that it takes to turn these drums. And um, he produced a, a very compact, easy-to-use instrument for measuring elongational uh, viscosity. Now, the bonus of this is that it fits into standard uh, shear rheometer. So this device was designed, here's one version of it, was designed so that these ends would just fit into a standard um, regular shear rheometer. And so all you need to do is buy this device if you already have this shear rheometer and you're good to go. Huge improvement over having to either buy an entire instrument or devise one yourself if you're doing something like the Pfizer. How do the data look? Here are his data from the Journal of Rheology in 2005. Uh, this is a comparison of the instrument working on a variety of different host instruments. So this is the TA Instruments Aries rheometer. And um, I'm not sure what instrument this is, the M MCR501, another brand of a shear instrument. And it's perfectly reproducible. And here's some data with some literature comparison. This is very uh, reliable data from Munstedt in Germany. And this is his data. And you can see that he is able to get this shear this elongation, tension, thickening, and then thinning result. If I had 20,000 bucks, I'd own one of these uh, because it's, it's really, for the first time, something that uh, you can use to, to get reliable laboratory measurements of these kinds of samples. You can tell from the structure, though, that it won't work for everything. It really will work nicely for rubbers. They're very, they're very liquidy. No, they're not liquidy. They're, they're deformable at room temperature. Uh, there is something of an issue of the oven. I think this fits into the oven on most instruments, uh, which would be essential for doing melts. If the material is too drippy, this is not going to work. Okay, so it's limited to having a certain amount of viscosity at the temperature you're measuring. So there are some cons on it, but it's really quite, quite a valuable instrument. Now, if you do have something that's runny, you can do these uh, Kaber experiments. So this is capillary break, capillary break up extensional rheometer. And this requires a bit of, of modeling. So again, it's this test where you put a sample between two plates and pull them apart. But instead of trying to produce a very long filament and then monitor the cross section and see if it's an elongational flow, they just do a step up. And then they watch as the filament thins, narrows, thins, and finally breaks. Okay, so it's a step elongation. The filament continues to deform, and the flow is driven by surface tension. All right, so that's a very interesting device, only obviously for materials within a certain range. This has been 
commercialized by Hakka Instruments. Uh, the Cambridge Polymer Group is uh, Gareth McKinley again at MIT. And uh, this instrument uh, we also had in Korea. It's de a desktop instrument of use for, for some materials. When you compare the capillary breakup experiments with those filament stretching experiments, you can start to see really um, some of the, I don't know, the uncertainty. We have two instruments. We don't really know if either is correct. And look how much they differ. So these are the capillary breakup experiments. This is the Troughton ratio, which is the elongation of viscosity divided by the shear v viscosity divided by the elongational strain. So this is like a startup curve in elongational flow, normalized against the steady shear viscosity. And we see a good reproducibility within the method. And the lines are relating to some modeling assumptions to see whether that's the predicted result. But the Pfizer experiments show a much different, um, the, the filament stretching experiments show a much different result. It's really only arguable which is correct or, or how correct either of them are because these data are so difficult to take that there's no one correct way that we could definitely say that these materials, um, that this is the elongational viscosity of these materials. So that was a, a short tour of a bunch of attempts to measure true elongational viscosity. And now I can give you uh, the older, an older but something we can actually do in our laboratory method of estimating elongational viscosity using a quite inhomogeneous flow. And that's uh, capillary entrance flow. So this is a, a very well-known flow to produce elongational effects. Imagine you have this block of fluid. It goes into this contraction. It'll certainly stretch out. But there are also shear effects here. Um, usually, some sort of a recirculation starts here in the corners. And so there's some sort of a shearing going on at the walls. And somehow, far from the center here, there'll be some shearing going on the closer and closer you get to the walls. So like all of our rheometer experiments, um, we have to make a bunch of assumptions. And the list of assumptions are right here. And really, I don't intend for you to, to see them so much as to realize that it's a very, very long list. So these were the assumptions made by Cogswell to simplify the analysis of this flow so that you could back out a steady an elongation. He required that you know the shear, you, know, you must know the shear properties. And then we make all kinds of assumptions. If we make all the Cogswell assumptions, it's a, a fairly simple measurement. You need to measure uh, entrance pressure loss, which comes from the Bagley correction. Remember back on the capillary, we talked about pressure drop um, versus L over D, and that they would intersect here at some non-zero value. That's delta P entrance. This is capillary flow. And if the flow into the capillary is an abrupt contraction, that's exactly the flow we're talking about. So if the flow into your capillary is an abrupt contraction like this, you can measure these entrance pressure effects as a function of flow rate. If you know the shear viscosity, that's all you need. You plug it into the formulas, and you get the elongational viscosity. Now, these are terrible and complex and very restricting assumptions. So Binding, David Binding, Great Britain, decided to make what he considered less stringent assumptions. And once again, you have to know the steady shear properties. In his case, rather than calculate one value of the elongational viscosity, he assumes that the elongational viscosity is a power law. And he just wants the power law coefficient and, and exponent as his results. This is a much more complicated calculation, but nothing that Excel can't handle. It's really not such a big deal. There's a numerical integration that must be done. Fundamentally, you once again measure flow rate versus entrance pressure loss. And you need to know the steady shear viscosity. We do these experiments in the lab. And you can get this result. Now, besides these kinds of true tests that are actually trying to measure material functions, there are also industrial tests for elongational properties. 
And this is a very, uh, a very uh, popular one. It's called the Rayotens test. It's produced by an instrument manufactured by Gutford. And it's a fiber spinning draw up problem. So imagine you have flow through a capillary, and then you have this uh, extrudate flow coming out. And you grab the flow, and you, you accelerate it by pulling on it with these, with these rollers. So this is not a standard flow. This is not elongational flow, but it's something. And it's, it's something that you can correlate with the properties of your, of your process, for instance. And this has got excellent reproducibility. It's very easy, and it's very widely used in, in industry. Here are some data from uh, uh, Manfred Wagner from Germany who's a, a very good rheologist from 1998, taking this test, which is a bit of an industrial black box test, and seeing if he could find something universal about it. And he was able to find that through appropriate shifting of the data, you can produce a, a master curve of the rail tense force versus this draw ratio rate. And you can do some things like detect when instabilities will occur in a, in a process. The analysis in this paper is quite complex. You're in a position to understand it if you need to, but it would require a considerable amount of study to, um, to understand that test. So in summary, uh, for rheometry, we have shear rheometry and elongational rheometry. Uh, shear tests are very easy to make. You choose among the various instruments based on fluid properties and what rates of deformation you want to obtain. And there are um, some details that are handled by most modern instruments that sometimes will cause you trouble. Instrument inertia, uh, resonance if you have a rotating rheometer of some sort, uh, things that are going on with the design. But for the most part, shear rheometry is very straightforward. Elongational property measurements are still not routine, although that sentiment uh, elongational rheometer is the, is the closest thing to bringing that to a routine test. Um, newer instruments are making inroads into improving the situation, but it still requires um, a very expert hand. Because these are so difficult, and be, because elongational properties even so are very important, industries tend to rely on things like this Rayotens, which at least they can, if they're lucky, they can calibrate with their actual problems happening on the line, uh, even though they don't know exactly what it means. So sometimes that's still the best choice. We don't know what it means, but at least it correlates with the problem we're having. Okay, so that's it. That's, that's uh, what I wanted to tell you about rheometry. Now let's, let's talk uh, in the last 20 minutes, 25 minutes, let's talk about homework seven. Has everybody tried problem three? Okay, so the, I want to um, discuss the issue of the strain calculation in problem three because I don't think I did an example of this. I think I maybe skipped over the example I normally do. And you're going to need it to do this part of the test. So problem three is to calculate the startup function which you've calculated a bunch of times for, for the Newtonian. I think I calculated in class for the generalized Newtonian. I either did or you did. We've seen it quite a bit. So for instance, for the Newtonian case, we know that eta plus is just this step up function. It's zero. Then it steps up to a value of the viscosity. So this is eta plus as a function of time, always a function of time. For the generalized Newtonian fluid case, same deal. Um, it stepped up, but what we did see is that it steps up to a value that depends on the elongation rate. Okay, So the level depends on, what am I saying, elongation rate. Depends on the shear rate. But once again, it's a function of time. Then on the last homework, on homework six, I asked you to do it for uh, the generalized linear viscoelastic fluid. 
And some, some answers I received were that eta plus equals some number. You know, eta plus is equal to um, g lambda, let's say. But that's, that's not correct. I mean, this is a function of time. It's always a function of time. And so it, it was, when, when you saw that as your answer, that was maybe meant to be a clue that you'd made a mistake in your analysis. In fact, the generalized linear viscoelastic model is the first model that predicts a gradual rise. So in this case, when time t equals zero, it's zero, and then it's a gradual rise. So this is also a function of time. And from the solution to homework six, we have the answer here. Viscosity, eta plus. What we got was that eta plus as a function of time is equal to the integral from zero to t of g of t, g of s ds. For the generalized linear viscoelastic model, and if you put in g of s for the generalized Maxwell model, you get eta plus equals, and you do the integral, the summation k equals one to n of g k lambda k, one minus e to the minus t over lambda k. That's in the solution. I'm going to write it again since I ended up crowded there. Generalized Maxwell model, eta plus of t is the summation k equals 1 to n g k lambda k, 1 minus e to the minus t over lambda k. And so this exponential is giving us this, this gradual rise at t equals 0. So in the homework, I've asked you to calculate this for the Lodge model. Now, there is a, a big shift in calculation method that's happened between all of these previous cases and the current case. In all these previous cases, the generalized Maxwell, the generalized linear viscoelastic, the generalized Newtonian, we always started with the shear rate. So we had let's say for the generalized linear viscoelastic model, we always started with tau equals minus the integral from zero to t of g of t minus t prime gamma dot of t prime dt prime. Okay, so we needed gamma dot and when we pr we're predicting uh, this startup, we would go and look what that was, and gamma dot was zero, sigma dot of t. So if I made this gamma dot of t prime, I put a t prime there, sigma dot of t prime, zero, 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 zero. Okay, that's what gamma dot was. And so then we had tau two one equals the same integral, the same g, and we just put this guy in there. And look back on homework six, the way that I got to this final result was to put this sigma dot in correctly. So the incorrect way was to say sigma dot of t prime is equal to zero for t less than zero is equal to gamma dot naught for t prime greater than or equal to zero, okay? So I don't care about the zero part, I'll put in just the gamma dot, you put in a gamma dot here, and do the complete integral. And the reason that was wrong is because if you just put gamma dot in here and keep the integral limits exactly the same, you haven't done this flow at all. You've done steady shear flow. If you just put gamma dot naught in here for all time, you have not put this function in. You have put in sigma dot of t prime equals gamma dot naught for all time. And that's steady shear flow. And so that's why many of you got the steady shear flow result. Okay, so what was the right way to do it? 
the right way to do it was it's not this for all time, right? It's gamma dot naught only when t prime is greater than zero. So look at my limits. I have to break up these limits. From minus infinity to zero, I'll put a zero in here. And from zero to t, I'll put in this gamma dot naught. And so to do the generalized linear viscoelastic case, we have tau 2, 1 equals, I'll put the minus side on the left, two integrals, minus infinity to t plus, excuse me, minus infinity to 0 and 0 to t of the same thing, g of t minus t prime, g of t minus t prime, here times 0 and here times gamma dot naught. This term goes out, and so the net effect was just to change the limits. But changing the limits was the whole deal. Okay? The changing of the limits brought about this wonderful exponential. Because if you, if you go back and review your solution for the steady shear flow case, by having the limits be the complete limits from minus infinity to t, the minus infinity term made one whole part of the integral just completely drop out. I'm not going to drop out anymore because now you're doing 0 to t instead of minus infinity to t, and that gives the exponential. Okay. So go back and look at that um, and, and see if you can uh, understand my point there. And now I'm going to move that point one step further because we're going to try to do the Lodge model. Okay. The Lodge model totally different from the generalized linear viscoelastic. It has the strain in it, not the strain rate. And so we're going to be in a complicated situation in order to calculate the strain properly to put it into the Lodge model. So let's start with the Lodge model. Tau is equal to plus the integral from minus infinity to t. Is it minus? Okay. I was just going to double check. I thought every time there was a strain, yeah, it's minus. You're right. Minus the integral from minus infinity to t, a to naught over lambda squared, e to the minus t minus t prime over lambda. Finger tensor, t prime t dt prime. And before we panic over the finger tensor, we just look it up in the table. And the finger tensor is given as 1 plus gamma squared, gamma 0, gamma zero, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So to get tau to 1, all right, we get minus the integral from minus infinity to t, all this stuff out front, which is our uh, memory function, gamma dt prime. Now, gamma is not gamma dot. Gamma, if you go back to this table, is defined as the integral from t prime to t of sigma dot dummy variable dt prime. This is the tricky part. Okay. We need to do this integral correctly. Then we plug it in here, and then we just have calculus to do. No big deal. Okay, gamma equals the integral from t prime to t, sigma dot of t double prime dt double prime. So this is the strain between two times. This is sigma dot of t or of t double prime. At time t equals 0, it jumps up to gamma dot naught. So if both t prime and t are over here, this is an easy integral to do. Gamma equals the integral from t prime to t of gamma dot naught dt double prime, which is gamma dot naught t double prime evaluated from t prime to t, which is equal to gamma dot 
gamma dot naught t minus t prime. Now, I said this is correct when t prime and t are both greater than zero. Okay? Now, we're, we're mostly interested in t greater than zero because we know that when t is less than zero, we haven't even done the step yet, so nothing has happened. So t is greater than zero always, always that we're interested. So that's good. How about t prime? It can be below zero. Okay, let's see why that's the case. What are we going to use this in? We're going to use this in this prediction of the shear stress. We're going to put it here. Okay? What can T prime be in this integral? It, it cannot be greater than T. But over what range does T prime vary? It goes from what to what? Right. It goes from negative infinity to T. So we need to consider the case when t prime is less than zero and when it's greater than zero. It's never going to be greater than t. So we go back here. We are occasionally going to care that t prime is over here, not just here. So this case, gamma equals gamma dot naught t minus t prime, is the case when t prime is greater than zero or equal. Okay, from here to here, that's a good c c calculation. Now, redraw. This is gamma dot naught. This is zero. Now t prime's back here. Now I want to calculate the integral from t prime to t of sigma dot of t double prime dt double prime. What's the area under the curve from here? to here. Gamma dot t. Right. Gamma dot t. We can do it formally with the calculus, but it's easier to just see it right there. It's just gamma dot t. We can do it at, with the calculus. It's integral from t prime to zero, dt double prime, plus the integral from zero to t, dt double prime, of, sig of sigma dot of t double prime. But sigma dot is zero between t prime and zero. And it's gamma dot naught between zero and t. So this goes to zero. And we get uh, gamma dot naught t double prime from zero to t, or exactly what Carl said, gamma dot naught t. So gamma equals gamma dot naught t when t prime is less than zero. And that's all you need to finish this problem. So, summary. When t prime is less than zero, gamma equals gamma dot naught t. When t prime is greater than or equal to zero, gamma equals gamma dot naught t minus t prime. We're going to put them into the stress tensor, sometimes the shear stress, sometimes the normal stresses, for the Lodge model, which is eta naught over lambda squared e to the minus t minus t prime over lambda times the finger tensor dt prime. 1 plus gamma squared, gamma 0, gamma 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So gamma changes value depending on what t prime is. So we're going to change the limits of the integral. From minus infinity to 0, we'll put that in. From 0 to t, we'll put this in. When we put this one in, it's just a constant. We're integrating over t prime. T is a constant with respect to T prime, so we just put a constant in and integrate the exponential. When 
t is greater than 0, so from 0 to t, we put this in, but it's a variable. Because when we change this to the integral over s, look at this. This is gamma dot naught s. So this term is going to be like s e to the s. So there'll be one integral that's like an e to the s, and one integral that's like an s e to the s. When we do n1, we're just going to put a 1 in and get this integral again. And that can be integrated over the entire limits. Then we put this guy in, which is going to be this when t prime is less than 0, and this when t prime is greater than 0. So it breaks into 2 again, 1 from minus infinity to 0, and 1 from 0 to t. The 1 from minus infinity to 0 will have this in it, so it'll look like this again. The 1 with gamma squared in it will have an s squared e to the s over lambda term that has to be integrated. So you can get these integrals out of a table or math, MathCAD, or you could do them yourself, or maybe your integrating calculator can do them. Uh, but those are the three integrals that you'll have to do to, to finish out the result. So you, you'll need tau 2, 1 to get the shear viscosity. You'll need tau 1, 1 and tau 2, 2 to get um, psi 1 and psi 2. But you can tell me right away what psi 2 is, right? What is it? Zero. Psi 2 is zero, but psi 1 is not. You can actually save yourself one integral by subtracting these first, right? If you calculated tau 1, 1 minus tau 2, 2, look, there's, something's going to cancel, right? And you can skip one whole integral, although it's not a hard one to do. And just go straight to the gamma squared. Now, to see if you really get this, you could try, you know, for those of you who are studying for the final, you could try to do this for cessation. Okay? Same logic, same logic, but now this is the function. Here's 0, here's t prime, here's t, or here's t prime and here's t. You could try it. Come see me, I'll tell you if you're on the right track. Okay? Same kind of a problem. Okay, so are there other questions? When, when can you have the homeworks in? Hmm? It's due today. Oh, does it? Oh, I, I, is that right? On the syllabus, it's due today, I thought. Oh, it's due Friday. Well, my mistake. I'm out of town for the next two days, by the way. So maybe that's why I thought it was due today. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to give everybody a heart attack. Okay, uh, does anybody need more than Friday to do the homework? If you do and you don't want to say in public, you can come tell me in private. And is everybody good? Uh, we have one, I know one person wants to take the final a day late because he has three finals or something on Wednesday. Is there anybody else who has any trouble taking the final on Wednesday? No? It's going to be all what? This is just from the lab, uh, from the like, no. to, no. to uh, It's cumulative, which is to your advantage, right? Because the early stuff was easy. Newtonian, uh, uh, vectors and tensors, that stuff's so easy now. And then generalized Newtonian, uh, generalized linear viscoelastic, and advanced stuff. So it squeezes out the advanced stuff. So that's good, right? So that's to your advantage. Um, take a look at the final that's on the web. I will be in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week, so by the time you get around to studying, uh, we can talk. Could you, uh, I guess, let's sort it out. You have 58 seconds. It's just uh, the torque for the, it's, uh, for the small speakers, so it's very, like, uh, and you go back to the I, I guess I'll. You know, it's, yeah, it's just a question of looking at this equation here. It's, it's much easier than you think. So if you're talking about code and plate. Well, yeah, but the problem is like, that I found is, do you, uh, do you have to use, I mean, because the obvious thing would be just, just use a, a code and plate with a bigger radius. That's a real answer. Uh, and how would the, ask yourself how the angle would affect it. Ask yourself how the radius would affect it. 
that's, that's all you can really do is change the geometry a little bit. And in fact, uh, these instruments are supplied with different cones for that very purpose. Now, if you ask that question on parallel plate, what can you do to increase the, the torque on the parallel plate? Bigger discs, closer together. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's not that hard. Okay, good. Well, then I'll look for your homeworks and uh, see you on Wednesday or earlier if you have any questions for the final.